Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for tuning in. Those of you at home to the first ever episode of The Boylston Report. My name is Jackson Tolliver, and I'll be your host. You might know me from shows like The Box Score, Good Morning Emerson, or my new EIV show that just got picked up, Too Hot to Handle, Emerson College Edition. <laughs> it took a long time to get this thing off the ground. It took a lot of effort. I'm so incredibly proud of our team that we have assembled here. I'd like to give a huge shout out to my co-executive producers, Avi Scheinberg and Lily Sexton, for running everything behind the scenes. Come on. Huge shout out. Now, obviously, there's so much going on in the world these days, as people say as opposed to those days where there was nothing going on at all. <laughs> but seriously, this country seems more divided than ever, so that's where we come in. We're beyond excited to announce that we are planning to end all of the world's biggest conflicts on this show. Can we get some applause for that, please? We're going to end the Israel-Palestine conflict, the Russia-Ukraine war, and the classic question, which came first, the chicken or Republican Senator Lindsey Graham? <laughs> but in all seriousness, we hope to provide you with all the news in an exciting and entertaining way, we hope to be funnier than your other typical news programs, except Tucker Carlson tonight. We can't beat that one. You can't laugh harder at anybody than that guy. <laughs> so sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. You're watching The Boylson Report. Let's get started with some headlines, as usual. Now, the U.S. military shot down an unidentified object flying above Michigan this weekend, making it the fourth airborne object downed by American forces in just over a week. Now, last week, China claimed ownership of one of the objects, dubbed a spy balloon. This balloon raises questions about previous gifts sent over by China, like two weeks ago when China tried to send over an ice cream cake with cameras hidden in the candles. <laughs> but wait, there's more. The week before, President Xi dressed up as a birthday clown to infiltrate Congress, but they tried to nominate him for the Speaker of the House. <laughs> this all took place from the inside of my cousin's Chuck E. Cheese birthday party. <laughs> for shooting down the balloon, the Pentagon was awarded 100 tickets, but they were only able to get two airheads and, ironically, a Chinese finger trap. <laughs> How to do it. Get it? Now onto the Russia-Ukraine war, where we're approaching the one-year mark of Russia launching their full-scale invasion. Russian forces over the weekend continue to shell Ukrainian cities and Ukrainians continue to push back. Ukrainian officials put out data claiming that Russian soldiers are dying in greater numbers this month than at any time since the first week of the invasion. But Ukraine's outgoing defense minister said Putin is threatening nuclear weapons and is growing increasingly unpredictable, to which Emerson College women responded, I can fix him. <laughs> These classified documents just keep showing up. Most recently, the FBI found one in Mike Pence's Indiana home. Surprisingly enough, it was a smash or pass list of all the men in Congress. <laughs> the most shocking part of the document was that he said he would smash Mitch McConnell. He even drew a bunch of hearts and stars around his name and 17 different fonts of the simple phrase, Mrs. Mike McConnell. <laughs> President Joe Biden was also found to have classified documents in his vacation home. This was the fourth time since November that classified records or material has been found at a private address of Biden's. But at least we found one thing Republicans and, and Democrats can agree on, how to mishandle documents. The FBI spent 13 hours searching Biden's home. It took that long because they were buried under bingo cards and two Xfinity user manuals. <laughs> I don't know why he had two of them. If you guys think that was crazy, have you guys heard of Hillary Clinton's emails ever? Emails are, are they're, they're just crazy, what's in there. Now, when asked about recently running for re-election, President Biden told reporters, quote, I'm just not ready to make it. Coincidentally, I'm just not ready to make it is what he told Jill on his way to use the restroom. <laughs> Florida Governor Ron DeSantis has revoked Disney's special status over its theme parks, meaning he and his administration have significantly more control over Disney World. The first order of business is to allegedly confirm that Timon and Pumbaa from The Lion King are not homosexual. <laughs> Former Boston Mayor Marty Walsh is stepping down from Biden's cabinet to run the NHL Players Association, a move which I didn't understand until I considered the fact that I transferred from a STEM school to Emerson College. 
Now, last week, President Biden gave us his second State of the Union address. There's a lot to talk about, both in terms of content and the reaction of fellow politicians. For more on the story, we have our correspondent, Thomas Pudiak, with more. Thomas. Last Tuesday, President Biden gave the State of the Union address before members of Congress. Now, I think that I found the optimal way to watch it. The day after, on 1.5 speed, so it sounds like he's kind of speaking a little bit coherently. <laughs> now, prior to the State of the Union, and this is true, George Santos was accused of stealing puppies. Now, never to be outdone, Marjorie Taylor Greene is planning on killing 101 of them. <laughs> also during the State of the Union, the president stated that Donald Trump had the worst economic downturn of any president in history. Unfazed by these attacks, Trump took to Truth Social to write that Jill Biden was a MILF. <laughs> Agreeing with this statement, Doug Emhoff. <laughs> now, I don't think that this is quite what Joe Biden meant when he called for bipartisanship. In his speech, Biden lamented parents having to drive their kids to McDonald's parking lots just to have some Wi-Fi to complete their homework. Oh boy, I miss the good old days when the only reasons parents would drive their kids to McDonald's parking lots was to use the play place as a daycare so they could shoot up heroin. <laughs> hey, speaking of shooting, Biden also made a case for more police training. More police training. I absolutely agree with this one. Do you know how long it takes for police officers to graduate from the police academy? Six months. Do you know how long it takes to get an Emerson comedic arts degree? <laughs> Four <laughs> years, four years, eight times as much than it takes to get an Emerson Clown College degree than for police to receive a service weapon. Now, I don't really understand this because they're really not that different. Cops pin on their badges and comedy majors pin on their novelty squirting flowers. Good cop, bad cop is basically an Ovid and Costello routine. And at the end of the day, they both love shoving people into the backseat of their car. <laughs> Biden also seized on Republican outbursts uh, the, his accusation that they don't support Social Security, joking that he loves conversion. Finally, something both sides can agree upon. <laughs> now, Biden also set an agenda for eliminating any extra fees associated with ticketing platforms. It's reported that Joe is pissed not to get those Taylor Swift tickets. <laughs> Love them all too well, 10 minute version. <laughs> Finally, Biden also added that he wants to remove hidden fees for airline companies and remarked that airlines can't treat your children like a piece of baggage. They can't treat your pe children like a piece of baggage. There goes the m government meddling in my vacation plans once again. <laughs> you know what? I'm taking a stand. This is America. For Christ's sake, I mean, the entire American dream is that you can treat anybody, and I do mean every, anybody, like a piece of baggage. I remember when I was younger, my dad would take me on as his carry-on and just stuff me into overhead bins, whether or not there's space or not. And when I got too big, 55, 60 pounds, he'd check me at the kiosk and hope the airline wouldn't lose me. That <laughs> is the America I remember. So... Did that actually happen, or like, like... Getting stuffed into kiosks? Yeah, like the overhead bins, or like whatever was going on? Oh, sure, we'd practice for that. He had me, he had me train, actually, with a, uh, one, one of those contortionists to be able to snap myself into any position if needed. I actually dislocated my shoulder three times. Well, I'm glad, because you turned out great. Thank you so much. Thomas Pudiak, everybody. That was very enlightening, to say the least. We're gonna take a quick break, but don't go anywhere. Yesterday was the Super Bowl, and we took to the streets to find out how much, or maybe how little, our student body knew about the event. You're watching the Boylston Report. And when I arrive at my destination, I am gonna kill Bill. Hi, I'm Nate. And I'm Casey, and we're the National Broadcasting Society. Come out to some of our weekly workshops, or work on some of our sets. Explore the bigger picture with NBS. We'll see you there. All right, let's get another take. 
Camera, sound. Hi, I'm Mary Malloy, the host of Speechless, and you're watching The Emerson Channel. Welcome back, everyone. Let's jump right into it. The Grammy Awards were last weekend, and it was a big night for Harry Styles, who won Album of the Year. Here's what he had to say. I'm just, I'm just so... so uh, this doesn't, doesn't happen, happen to people, people like me very, very often, often, man. This, this is so, so, so nice. nice. Thank, Thank you very, very much. Yeah, you can see it on Adele's face. It doesn't happen to people like him very often. Now, I know he's getting a lot of backlash, but I just have to say, Harry, I totally get what you mean. It's, it's tough out there for white guys like us. We're always being forced to be the CEOs of major corporations. I mean, we even have the task of colonizing the entire Western world. And I had to be at the school for like six months before they just handed me my own show. They should have gave it to me from the beginning. Whatever. Uh, Tom Brady recently celebrated his retirement by taking a vacation and posting a photo of himself in his underwear. The photo gained quite some attention as you <laughs> Guys, I told you, I, I told you I didn't want this one up there anymore. Do I still have to even talk about this one? This is a stupid joke anyway, whoever wrote it. Now, now that he's retired and divorced, no one is more excited than his son. Come, come on! <laughs> who, who wrote that? It's fatherly love. Jesus. Uh, speaking of football, last night was Super Bowl 57, and for most of the country, it was an exciting game between the Eagles and the Chiefs, but for everyone at Emerson College, it was just another year of watching the commercials and pretending to be a Rihanna fan. <laughs> speaking of Rihanna, she uh, announced her pregnancy during the Super Bowl halftime performance last night. This comes just nine months after her and ASAP Rocky welcomed their first child. No wonder they call him ASAP Rocky. <laughs> it's quick. Um, oh, this one's good. An ad campaign ran at the Super Bowl claiming whatever you are facing, Jesus faced it too. I just think it's funny to argue this to the Super Bowl audience because from what I know about the Bible, Jesus never struggled with erectile dysfunction and internalized racism. <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, M&M's also ran an ad at the Super Bowl. <laughs> Cover your ears, Tucker Carlson. Uh, the M&M spokes candies are finally back for good after the company replaced them with Maya Rudolph in an attempt to desexualize their product. Yeah, I don't, I don't get it either, because between a bag of M&Ms and Maya Rudolph, I would much rather have sex with Maya Rudolph. Uh, in, in further attempts to degender their candies, Mars announced that they're removing the green one's go-go boots, the orange one's anxiety, and the red one's anger, and it's just being reported they'll no longer be drawing a vagina on the brown one. Uh, speaking, speaking of the Super Bowl, as everyone knows, all Emerson students are huge sports fans. The excitement for the big game yesterday was unmatched, so we sent out our field correspondent, Mill and Jane, to get a glimpse of what the student body was thinking. Let's see what he found. Mill and Jane, everybody. I'm here on Boylston Street, where students of Emerson College are bustling with excitement with the upcoming Super Bowl this Sunday. You can see, well, well, they will be here. They will be here, and they will be excited. So we decided to go to the streets and see what do they actually know about the Super Bowl. All right. We're with? Cam. Loving the glasses. Thank you. Now, Super Bowl weekend, who's playing? Oh, that's who. Do you guys know who's going to be playing in the Super Bowl? <laughs> we got to go. Yeah. Okay. yeah, you got to go? Have fun, guys. No, you don't. Um, it's a big weekend here for Emerson. Uh, it's the Super Bowl. Um, in fact, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Who, who, like, what cities do you think? Here, we have some help. Uh, that's an eagle. Right? Yeah, yeah, it is. It's an okay. eagle. Can you take, you want to guess where they're from? Like a state? Yeah, state. state. Um, California. Yes. You oh, right? Yeah. Really? Congratulations. Okay. Wow, that's pretty impressive. You want to take a guess? We have we have some helpers. Some birds. Some birds. birds. Uh, Super Bowl weekend. Oh, that's that's. Yeah. Right yeah. Okay. Um, who who's playing? Um, I'm gonna say the Flyers and the Rangers. Yes. It looks like a K and a C, and an arrow. Yes. What what city has K and a C in it? it has two letters. Kentucky. Two. Yes. Kentucky. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They, well, you're okay. doing really well. Oh wow. Okay. Um, can you guess the team name? I know it's a little tough, but. Spades. Spades. <laughs> like an arrow, something. Yeah, yeah. The Kansas City, uh, the Kentucky, sorry, the Kentucky Arrows. There is a fire truck going on right now. It's like the Eagles yeah. and that other guy. The Eagles, I know the Eagles yeah. are. There you go. You got the other one. 
No, no, you have to name the other one. Oh, you have to, I'm oh. sorry. <laughs> Green Bay Packers? Yes. What? The Eagles and the Green Bay Packers are facing off live in the Super Bowl. No, right. Tom Brady recently retired from the NFL. What team did he retire from? Ooh. Because his movie 80 for Brady is coming out. Yes. Where he stars in it. Um, he, he retired from the uh, Islanders. Yes. Yes, he did. Any city that comes to mind. Seattle. Up, whoa. Yes. Whoa. No Congratulations. Oh. Kentucky? Yes. Wait, are you serious? 100%. Congratulations. What did I win? Two tickets to the Boylston Report. Slay. So, congratulations. You won two tickets to the Boylston Report. Let's go. This is probably the best reaction I've ever gotten. Thank you for being so excited. As you can see, the hype for the Super Bowl has never been higher. For the Boylston Report, I'm Mill and Jane. Back to you, Jackson. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mill and Jane. Now, we're taking another break, but when we come back, prisoners donating organs to shorten their prison sentences, we interview an expert to find out more. It's all right here on the Boylston Report. Ten seconds. Ready, camera one. Camera one, you wide shot the entire thing, and in three, two, one, take. Tell you. Welcome back to Emerson College. Emerson trails. Camera four, get a shot of the players coming across the court. Ten seconds left. Emerson trails by one point. As camera two, close on the first two days. Thanks, Joe. With ten seconds left. Welcome back to the Boylston Report. We're going to jump right into it. A new bill proposed in the State House gives prisoners the opportunity to lessen their prison sentence, but the price of the freedom might literally cost them an arm and a leg. I can't make this stuff up. The legislation was filed earlier this month and would allow prisoners to donate organs or bone marrow, and in return they would get anywhere from 60 days to a year off their sentence. I had to call in an expert on this one, and unfortunately the man from the hit game, Operation, wasn't available. Instead, joining me now is a former congressional staffer and the president of Families Against Mandatory Minimums, Kevin Rang. Kevin, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Great. So let's get right into that issue. Can you break down the bill from your understanding of, of what it is? Yeah, and let me just say, because there's been a lot of dunking on this bill, and, I, and, and deservedly so, but I, I think you had some lawmakers in Pennsylvania and in Massachusetts who had sort of two goals that they wanted to achieve. One, they sort of probably agreed with FAM that people are serving too long in prison. And they also want to address the problem of a shortage of donations and uh, organs and bone marrow and the rest. So those are two sort of laudable goals. The problem came when they tied them together. Yeah, that was, that was sort of what I was thinking too. It's a good idea, but it doesn't seem like, you know, once you get into the ethical questions of it, it gets uh, questionable. So lawmaker Carlos Gonzalez, who is co-sponsoring the bill, argued that the new law would help expand the pool of potential donors across the state. Here in Massachusetts, there are currently more than 4,000 people waiting for organs, but a lot of the conversation online is about how this is not the way to go about it. So do you see how this bill could be effective, or does it feel straight out of a sci-fi movie? I think it's problematic in a lot of ways. One, if you're concerned, your biggest concern is public safety. It's not as if if somebody, you know, if it's a threat to society and we can't let them out of prison right now, we, we want them to serve another year. But if they gave an organ, somehow we're going to be safer as a result. So from a public safety standpoint, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And then even from a humanitarian standpoint, I don't think we want to create a subclass of humans whose organs we're harvesting uh, to help people on the outside. And and so I just think, again, I think the impulse was good. I, I just think the execution was bad. So do you think prisoners would actually go for it if this became an option? I do think they would. Um, I spent a year and a half in federal prison myself. And as, uh, as I told one reporter, you know, you missed your family, you would do anything to get out, right? And so, I, I mean, and, and that's where you worry about the coercive effect, right? Like I've joked about this, you know, donating organs, like, what if, you know, you get three years off if you donate a limb, I mean, or a finger, I, I, you know, where does that end uh, in terms of, of um, asking people to give up um, their autonomy? Um, I mean, the good thing is the program is voluntary, but it's nothing feels voluntary when you're in prison. And so the idea of trying to get home, I think a lot of people will be inclined to do it. The flip side is this. I think people, some of the sponsors of the bill have come back and said, well, this is really designed 
because there's people outside, you know, and um, and family members who are incarcerated would be the natural donors. I don't think people in prison need extra incentive to save their loved one's life. Um, people in prison love their families as much as anybody else does. And if they thought that they could help them or save them in some way, they, they, they'd want to donate. And so I think to the extent that the law doesn't allow that today, it should. But I think, again, when you tied it to this sort of carrot and incentive, it got out of control. All right. Well, that's about all we have. Thank you so much for your time, Kevin. This is very insightful. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, folks, you heard it here first. Our lawmakers are really receptive to our calls for prison reform. But when I inevitably go to prison, I'll need all the help I can get. So if you have any organs to spare, you can send them over to Emerson College. All organs are welcome. Just please do not send me your penis. <laughs> we'll be right back. You're watching The Boylston Report. Oh, hey there. I'm Jamie Sanders, host of MTV Games. What am I doing in a ball pit? Hello? Hello? What, what am I doing in a ball pit? I'm all alone. Please watch the show. Welcome, welcome back everyone. Let's get right back into it with more of this week's top stories. Now, George Santos, the Republican congressman from New York that has lied more than Bill Clinton, Pinocchio, and my high school history teacher combined, has been caught in yet another bluff. Personally, I can't keep up anymore, so I'm turning to one of our political correspondents, Danny Shojai, to break it down for us. Danny Shojai, everybody. Just a few days ago, it was revealed that Republican representative of New York, George Santos, had stolen four golden retriever puppies from an Amish farmer in 2017. But, of course, we all know that this is not the only thing that he has lied about. Basically, every aspect of his resume has been fabricated in some way. For starters, he claimed he worked for Goldman Sachs and Citigroup in the 2010s, but after a confrontation with the Times, he admitted that never happened in the first place. But the thing about George Santos is that he isn't just making politically flattering lies. He has lied about things that have nothing to do with his campaign whatsoever, seemingly for the fun of it. For example, Santos has claimed that he was the star player of the Baruch College volleyball team. And not only was he not the star player, he wasn't on the team, he didn't even go to the school. <laughs> but can you think of a lamer thing to lie about? He might as well have said he was like the host of his college's political satire show. <laughs> not impressive, not interesting, a little embarrassing. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's right. He also said he acted in the Uma Thurman film The Invasion in 2007. Except A, he definitely wasn't in that movie, uh, and B, neither was Uma Thurman. <laughs> so that's just a bad lie. Uh, and he also claimed that he went to Brazil to become a journalist. And while he did move to Brazil, it was actually to be a drag queen. <laughs> His name was Kitara Ravash, and I'm not going to lie, he looks pretty good. <laughs> but to be honest with you guys, I don't like making fun of him for that. I don't like making fun of him at all. Can anyone really say that they've never embellished their resume before? That's how we play this little game, you know? The only reason I got this job is because I told Jackson I could connect him with my uncle, Trevor Noah. <laughs> Do you think that photo was enough proof of that? <laughs> yeah, uh, I really wouldn't be working here if I had that kind of pull. Um, and I mean, did you think I got into Emerson all on my own? For example, for context, that photo was taken before he was canceled. <laughs> My point is, is that you embellish, you omit, and that's how you get the part. I doubt George or I are the first to do it. I don't know, what didn't I lie about on my resume? Uh, I'm not actually a red belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I don't have my hepatitis B vaccine. And I did not rob that 7-Eleven behind my house. <laughs> the only true thing on my Boylston Report application is that I actually am friends with Jackson's mom. <laughs> That's her at my eighth grade graduation. Sweet, sweet woman. Uh, they let you smoke there, which is so weird. I didn't know you were friends with my mom. Yeah, it was before you. It was I just, just between us. Thank you so much. Danny Shojai, everybody. Now, 
we're getting to the point in the show where I'm running low on time, but we still have a lot to cover. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you, the audience, uh, two news stories, and you guys get to pick which one we talk about. Here we go. Let's take a look at story number one. The latest economic numbers show inflation is slowing down, but not for people who buy eggs. The average price for a dozen of eggs has more than doubled over the past year. And how about clip number two? Police say the man suspected of stealing two monkeys from the Dallas Zoo last week admitted he broke into the zoo at night, stole those monkeys, and then took them on a dart train to an abandoned house. New court documents detail the alleged confession 24-year-old Davian Irvin made to investigators after his arrest. Police say he also admitted he pet a clouded leopard that he let out of its enclosure last month. He apparently committed these crimes because he likes animals. So which one do you guys want to hear about? Let me hear it. Let me hear it. Two. Two. All right, so you heard it there. A man in Dallas was arrested for stealing two monkeys from a zoo. After he was arrested, he told police he'd do it again. And I respect the dedication, I really do. But if those monkeys can hear me right now, I miss you guys so very much. <laughs> Let's try another story. It's up to you again. Here's option number one. The Sumner Tunnel is closed for another weekend of scheduled repairs, but this weekend the construction may be extra noisy for neighbors in East Boston. And number two. A neighbor dispute ends with one person in jail after a pet chicken is found dead. James Nick says the rooster was a menace in the neighborhood and it attacked him. Nick says the rooster attacked people. He says he was only defending himself when he hit the rooster. His neighbor later found the rooster dead in a ditch and called police. Well, that's when Nick went to jail. And now that he's out, he feels he never should have been arrested. Chickens are dying every day, people, at churches, Popeyes, and Kentucky Fried Chicken. Really? <laughs> Do I even have to ask? <laughs> I'll hear it anyway. Right. Yeah, okay. Well, as you heard, the man was arrested for killing a chicken. He was officially charged by courts with foul play. That's so stupid. <laughs> at least he was factually accurate. He didn't mention chickens dying every day at Chick-fil-A because they're closed on Sundays. <laughs> <laughs> we got one more story for you. Transport and public services in France are being badly disrupted today by another day of strikes uh, in protest at government plans to raise the age of retirement. Uh, they want to put it up from 62 to 64. Okay, one more, one more. Which one's it going to be? Police in Suffolk County, New York, are looking for this man. He walks in here, see, so pulls out the gun, tried to rob the store. He actually fired the gun at a wall behind the clerk. This clerk is stoic. What does he do? He, he stands there and then he reaches down and, and he has a machete. He pulls out the machete and chases the attempted robber out of the store. But it gets even better because then the, the chase continues into the parking lot where the guy with a gun is so scared of the guy with the machete he doesn't actually turn around and shoot. France or a knife man? <laughs> okay. That's right. He literally brought a knife to a gunfight and won. And if that's not New York, I don't know what is. Never one to be overshadowed. George Santos is now claiming that he was the clerk, <laughs> which is weird because he's usually the one doing the stealing. That's, that's a good one. I like that. Well, folks, that is about all the time we have for you tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Make sure you join us again in two weeks for our next episode. But for now, stay cool and watch the sky for balloons. I heard China might send up a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle one next. Good night. <laughs>